turn on a punch, there's a love on a horse. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Unless it's my horse. But if it's not my horse. <laughs> well, I don't want my horse to come out as a... <laughs> you see, I'm in favor of homosexuals in the army. I am. I wouldn't bend over backwards over it, but that's how I feel about it. <laughs> It's a little too clever for this side. Let me explain it. <laughs> you understand this? This is going on to the same direction in the United States. I don't know if it's so true here. Do you know that they have special fat organizations to make sure that you don't fire a person from any job for being overweight? Now, there happens to be a big problem. A lot of fat people couldn't get a job just because they were fat. And you were able to throw a guy out because you thought he was too fat. That is selfish and disgusting. A fat person should be able to get a job. But they went overboard with it in the United States. Now, no matter how much you weigh, nobody has a right to fire you. You could weigh 9,000 pounds. It's nobody's business. American Airlines, American Airlines lost the case against the fat stewardess. But they tried to fire her for being overweight. She won the case. They decided it's unconstitutional. She's allowed to be as fat as she wants. Now, when you go on American Airlines planes, all the stewardess are going like this. <laughs> Hello, come right in. <laughs> like that. All their planes are now flying like this. Listen to, listen to this. Are you busy? I'll tell you the whole story. <laughs> One fat yet that American Airlines was so fat that she couldn't get into the tra you know, she couldn't get the tray into the aisle. She was too fat, couldn't get into the aisle. Stuck with the food in front of the <laughs> Aze. She was stuck there, and all the Jews on the plane were going. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't figure out what to do. So you know what they did? They made it a buffet, and that's it. <laughs> Did you, hear, did you hear about the guy in Louisiana that was fined $10,000 just because he looked at a woman's breast? Now, the religious people here, don't, uh, maybe it's not an appropriate joke for you because you wouldn't look at a woman's breast. At least that's what you tell your wife. But that's what, and it's not an appropriate thing here. But in the United States, everybody assumes that a normal person can't help looking at a woman's breast. If you're not a fake, we're leaving you out. But a guy was fined $10,000 just for looking at a woman's breast. Do you understand this? Because the judge decided that he looked too long. That's, that's reverse sexism that's going on in the United States today. To protect women, they're protecting them to such an extent they're becoming idiotic. He looked too long at a woman's breast. Listen to this. It goes according to how much time. Past a certain amount of time, it's not looking, it's leering. This guy didn't have a watch. He thought he was looking. <laughs> well, what could you, how could you help it? Here's a parking side, here's a car, and here's a breast. What are you going to look at? You understand? <laughs> we'll leave that joke out. It's not for you. You've seen enough, you heard about it, Hobbes and that. It's not. You have to be careful what you say because there's a lot of religious people here and I respect you, I respect you, your whole attitude. And I come from a very religious family myself and I come from a family who was proud to be Jewish. You know, in the United States, that's one of the big problems. A lot of Jews are not too proud to be Jewish in the United States. As a matter of fact, the only persecution I ever suffered from in my career was from Jews who are embarrassed that I'm so Jewish that I sound so Jewish, or I look Jewish, or I talk Jewish, Jews get very embarrassed by it. Jews in the United States like to think they're Gentiles, they look like Gentiles, they can't, they can't wait to marry a shiksa to at least be close to a Gentile. Something about a Gentile has to be involved with them. They're ashamed of their names, they're ashamed of their noses. They tell you how proud they are to be Jewish, they all tell you how proud they are. There is not one Jew in the United States that wouldn't tell you how proud he is to be Jewish. As soon as he finishes telling you how proud he is, he cuts off his name, his nose cuts off everything he's got. <laughs> Noses in the United States on Jews are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Pretty soon there'll be no nose at all, just a face without a nose. Because they're all embarrassed to be Jewish. They are. You tell a Jewish girl in the United States she looks Jewish, tell her she looks Jewish, she'll stab you right in the heart. Their greatest pride is to convince themselves they don't look Jewish. Don't people say I look Hawaiian? Don't I look a little Hawaiian? I think I look more French. Don't I look Dutch? People say I look Spanish. I think I look a combination, Peruvian and Brazilian. What do I need to look? Don't I look? You look Jewish, you drag the end of that. That's right. People are embarrassed about anything Jewish. Do you know that to this day, to this day, Jews in the United States move into neighborhoods where no Jews are allowed. Do you know that? They actually move into neighborhoods where there's no Jews allowed. And there's nothing but Jews there. Each one thinks he's the only one. And they'll do anything to look like a Gentile. They'll put on brown shoes, white socks, anything. <laughs> they try to talk English perfect. Hello, you have to go to the toilet. 
They'll do anything to convince themselves they don't sound, they don't look Jewish. They're even a, do you know that they would never buy a dress made by a Jewish designer because it sounds Jewish? It's no designer. But to them, a designer is only a designer if he sounds French. Every Jewish yente in New York has to wear a dress made by a French designer, then they feel like a swinger. How come there's no such thing as a Jewish designer? It's a Jewish, too Jewish. If it's French, oh, class. That's a Hanukkah, it's French is class. That's to be a French designer. Every yente is wearing Yves Saint Laurent, Yves Saint Ladrec, Yves Saint Lachmecki, Yves Saint Lafon, Yves Saint Lundre, La Bre, La Me, La Chef, Red Racket, with her pretty hat. Did you ever see a Jewish woman saying, you know, I'm wearing my Horowitz today. This is my Horowitz. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has to have a French name. Do you understand this? There wouldn't even be a vacation to resort where there's too many Jews. Because that's eh, it's so much, it's too Jewish. It's got no class to them if there's a lot of Jews. Do you know a lot of Jews would never go to Miami Beach? They would never go there. Too many Jews, no class. They have to go to some Drek Island nobody ever heard of. So they could come back to the card game. You know where I was? I was in Makayuki. I was in Makayuki. <laughs> Where's Makayuki? Oh, not too far from Pakakoko. <laughs> you ever see the people go to these direct islands? There's nothing there but elephants, cockroaches, the zebras. The, the toilets don't work. The water doesn't work. The schmatness, the direct. There's no place to go, nothing to see. There's nothing but to hug at the rocks and elephants. And they're hiding from cockroaches and elephants. And they're taking inoculations, injections. And they can't see, they can't hear. It's a krochen, it's a hagat. They come back, what a time I had, this is the greatest time I ever had. I never had such a good time. <laughs> and they're nauseous and miserable from the whole experience. Where are you going now? Now I'm going to the hospital, I'm passing away. <laughs> you catch any Jew in one of those kaka, maybe it's a hug at the islands, you'll notice they have nothing at all to do there. They can't find one thing to do. What do you do with those black islands? Every time you meet a Jew there, where are you going? I don't know, where are you going? Good, I'll go with you. <laughs> Where is he going? I don't know. We'll go together before you know it. Four Jews are walking. They don't know why. They don't know where. They get. You ask, him, ask anybody who came from a vacation from those Kakamimi Islands. What did you do there? Oh, I was busy. The Lord tell you. Nobody has the nerve to admit that they wasted their time on a vacation. Because it invested a thousand to go, a thousand to come back, three thousand while they were there. They were laying around in the dreck with the schmatters. What are you going to tell you? That it was miserable? They'll never tell you that. They'll tell you what a time they had. What a time! I never had such a time. Ask them, what did you do? Do. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I did a lot. I was busy. What, with what? What? <laughs> I got up in the morning and what? And then we went. Where? Wherever it was, we went. And then what did you do? Then we came back. From where? From wherever we were. <laughs> and then we, then we got together and we went further. Further than what? We're from wherever we were, son of a bitch is up what? Well, you know where else Jews like to go? In the United States, they all like to say they went to Mexico. It's a status symbol in the United States to say, oh, I was in Mexico, Mexico. They spend three weeks in the toilet and they come back, what a vacation. <laughs> There's no worse shit house on earth than Mexico. It's the worst direct shit house in the world. Nothing to do there but go to a toilet. There's nothing to do. They can drink the water, they can eat the food, they can get up in the morning, they can lie down for a minute, they go back and forth from one toilet to the other toilet. To the other. That's all they do there. Did you enjoy Mexico? I never saw it, but the toilet. I never saw so many toilets in my life. I have they got toilets in Mexico. A lot of them don't even check into a hotel. They don't have a lift to see it. They go right to a toilet. You understand this? And Miami Beach, which is the greatest resort area on the site, the Jews of the United States, the ones who think they're upper class, they're swingers, they're upper, they're ashamed to go there. Too many Jews there. They didn't make it successfully enough if they're still in Miami Beach. Goyim love Miami Beach. They idolize it when they see it. They can't get over what a resort that is. Goyim are awed and stunned by the magnificence and the, and the phenomenal luxury of Miami Beach. They never saw anything like it. Because when, when, when Goyim on a, go on a vacation in the United States, they don't see luxuries. They see schmatas. Do you ever see how Gentiles go on a vacation? They put bottles of beer and schmatas in a car. They put more bottles and mayonnaise and jars and bottles and schmatas. A bicycle is on top and schmatas are laying there. <laughs> bottles and jars and bottles and more bottles and more jars and dreck and schmatas and blankets and blankets and schmatas and dreck and dreck. And they go riding and riding and riding, and when they see nothing, they say, Oh, what a great place for a vacation. Thank God we found it. There's nothing here. 
Then they take out all the dreck and the schmatters from the cars and the bottles and the mayonnaise and the jars and the beers and mizitz the mizitz on the grass and there's nothing there. This up, oh, it's this a vacation. This is nature. This is nature. Take a look at and the Jews are howling. It's dirty here. Let's get out of here. <laughs> When Jews see empty spaces, they only know one thing. This would be some spot for a condominium. <laughs> <laughs> Gentiles are celebrating nature. Jews are running around. Where's the lobby? Do you see a lobby? <laughs> you understand this? Gentiles either hike around with nature or they go to Fort Lauderdale. Most Gentiles who are on a vacation don't just sit around. Most Gentiles who are on a vacation are involved in exercises. Their, their idea of a vacation is to jump from waters, from oceans. They love to climb and fly, volleyball, handball, me, under the water, on top of the water, between the water. They love to fly from diving boards, me clap, me flick, me gate. They're all wearing sweatsuits and shvatas, me busy, busy. Do you ever see Gentiles on a vacation? If there's anything to do, they do it. They're throwing balls at nobody, they throw them. <laughs> They're busy. Who's there? Nobody. They're busy. Miami Beach, you can tell the Jewish. You know why? Nothing moves on Miami Beach. <laughs> so the Jew out of vacation is only looking for one thing, a place to sit, he sees a chair, it's a successful vacation, that's it. <laughs> Jewish resorts are the only resorts in the world that advertise brand new lobby. This is the lobby, that's the chair. <laughs> and they spend the whole vacation judging chairs. This is a better chair than that chair. <laughs> Ivy, you call this a chair? Come here, sit down, you gotta try this chair. Take a look, I found the chair. <laughs> when a Jew feels like an athlete, he makes an announcement, I'm going for a walk. <laughs> you know where they walk, another lobby, another chair, and that's it. <laughs> Jews want to think they're athletes, but there's no Jewish athletes. Maybe in this country there's some Jewish athletes. But in the United States, I never in my life saw a Jewish athlete. They never get involved in athletic activities, but the Meretzach and that they're almost involved, they're about to be involved. That's why when they check into a hotel, they always have to see the pool. Every Jew that checks into a hotel in New York has to say, where's the pool? I gotta see the pool. Where's the pool? That's the pool? Good. <laughs> then they sit down and they watch it for two weeks. <laughs> the Gentiles are flying from diving boards and the Jews are getting the hurtier from watching it. But you can't swim before he swims, he has to know, when did I eat? <laughs> if he ate any time in the last nine years, swimming is out. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Italians jump in with hero sandwiches. Let's go! <laughs> There's no Jewish athletes in the United States. Because Jews don't go in for athletic activities. It's all for Goyam. Jews go to college and that's it. I never saw a Jewish football player. In all my life, I never saw a Jewish football player. You throw a Gentile a football, he plays with it. You throw a Jew a football, he runs around. Who wants to buy a football? <laughs> it's not for Jewish people. Do you understand this? The only, the only athletic activity I ever see Jews get involved with is skiing, because skiing is a status symbol. They know that every successful guy flies around in mountains in France, in Argentina, there's special mountains for Goyim where they fly up and down. <laughs> When a Gentile gets very rich, they become the social cycle, and the social cycle flies from mountains with skis. And when a Jew wants to feel successful, and he wants to prove he's just as successful as a certain type of guy, he's a banker too, and he could compete with him. How does he compete? By skiing. The fact that he can't ski doesn't interest him. He goes to the ski slope. He goes to the ski slope and watches Gentile skiing for a month and a half, and he feels like he's a skier. <laughs> I never saw a Jew on top of a mountain skiing, but I see them all in the resorts. They're all in the ski resorts. They don't ski. They go there to feel like they went skiing. That's why when you see a Gentile on top of a mountain, he's there with torn underwear, a flit, a gate. He doesn't need an outfit, a sprint and flit. From, they love mountains and they love... Gentiles love snowstorms. They get a kick out of it. The more uncomfortable they are, the happier they are. When they're freezing to death, they say, ah, this is a pleasure. It's a pleasure for a guy to fly from a mountain in the middle of a storm. They love they love. When people spend their whole life trying to get rich, to be comfortable, as soon as it starts snowing, they're on top of a mountain like a putt passing away. To them. <laughs> when Jews go skiing, they go in a different way. They don't go to the top of a mountain skiing. They go to the shopping centers, picking out outfits. You like this? You like that? <laughs> you don't see Jews on top of mountains. You see them all in stores. For six months, they're picking schmatness before they go skiing. You like this? They go from house to house. You like that? How about this? 
Spring does it. Okay, this perfect. By the time a Jew goes skiing, he's the most perfect looking skier that ever lived. He can do everything except ski. <laughs> the only thing he can do. They roll outfit perfect. Then they go to the top of a mountain. They take a look. Hey, me can get hugged well. It's not for me. <laughs> they go right to the coffee shop. Rolls and butter, and that's it. Then they're ashamed to go home, so they put a chachka around the foot. Boy, was I scared. Do you understand any jokes, mister? <laughs> I'm looking at the Jewish husbands, they're afraid to laugh. When you tell jokes to Gentiles, they laugh. Jewish husbands don't laugh. They have to get permission from their wives. <laughs> the Jew never laughs unless he looks at his wife first. Isn't he funny? He's funny, isn't he? <laughs> he's not, he's not, he's not. <laughs> I thought he was, I thought he was. It's up to you, it's up to you. It so happens that I like him. I don't, I thought I did, I thought I did. They don't even order food without permission from their wives. Before a Jew orders food, they always look at her first. Do I like this? <laughs> it so happens that I like it. I don't. I thought I did. I thought I did. It's up to you. It's up to you. Jews have to get permission for everything they do. Because the wife is the boss. She's not working. How she became the boss, I don't know. No matter how much money he makes, her stitch does it. They can't even walk around in their own house. You ever see a Jew in his own house? He paid a half a million dollars for it, and he's the only one who can walk around in it. No matter where he goes, he's in the wrong place. He's in the wrong place. Man. You ever see a Jew in the right place at his own house? Never. As soon as he goes over here, get out of here, go over there. So he goes over here. No, you have to stand here. I'm, this is the part I'm doing. Can't you stand over there? Excuse me, I'll stand over there. He can't even go to the toilet. I'm going to the toilet. Not now, you can't go now. I just did the toilet. You couldn't go yesterday or Saturday. The only way you can make her happy is by passing away immediately. Because <laughs> no matter where he moves, he's in the wrong place. I'm going here. You can't go! I'm he's afraid to touch anything. You ever see a Jew who could touch anything in his own house? No matter what he touches, it's for the guests. It's for the guests. This is not for you. It's for the guests. If it costs nothing, he could touch it. As soon as it costs more than a quarter, it's not for you. It's for the guests. It's for the guests. He can't touch a glass. You ever see a Jew drink from a glass? Never. As soon as he touches, you got the wrong glasses for the guests. Every Jew you meet is walking around with a paper cup in his own house. He looks like a homeless man from a shelter someplace. Huh? I say if a Jew has any brains and he falls in love with a Jewish woman, what he should do is let somebody else marry her. Then you come to the house as a guest. You can do whatever you want. You understand this? It's like Yitzhak Shamir said to me a long time ago. You know, I don't like to get involved in Israeli politics. But I always loved Yitzhak Shamir, not only because of his policies, but also because he's such a brilliant speaker, one of the great speakers that ever. <laughs> I think he's the greatest speaker that ever lived. If I understood what he said, I'd give away the fortune to him. <laughs> Every time he made a speech, the whole country was walking around. What do you say? What do you say? Did you ever hear him speak? Well, all right, we'll take a look, we'll see what it is. And that's what we'll do. Not right now, then we will, we will. If we don't, then we won't. I don't know, all right. <laughs> I am, I am promise, I am promising you right now, but I promised before that if we have whatever we got, we'll take what it is. And we'll give it back wherever we got it. That's where we'll keep it. Otherwise, then we can. If we will, then why not? I don't see. It. All right. I said that before. I'm saying again because nobody knows what I'm talking about. So I... <laughs> Everybody was mad that he didn't want to give the West Bank back. Remember that? The truth is, that a lot of people don't know he wanted to give it back. He couldn't. It was in his wife's name. <laughs> Do you understand this? He wasn't too crazy about Yasser Arafat, and I don't blame him. People are arguing now, he's good, he's bad, he means it, he don't. No two Jews agree on what Yasser Arafat means. He definitely means it, he doesn't, he's only saying it. He's saying it harder than he would like to say it because he thinks we're watching him. If he turned around, you can't trust him, but you could trust him, not right now. We should wait, we should get a chance to trust him. In case he means it, we, in case he will, you still can't trust him. That's also true, but wait to see. We can't see, we gotta watch. Yeah. 
and the whole country is walking around. We trust them. We can't. We could. We shouldn't. I think we should. We could trust them a little, not that much. I almost trust them. Right now, I'm not sure, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Such a big problem. It's not easy to figure out. Let's be honest. It was only, people always thought of him as a terrorist. I found out he wasn't only a terrorist. He was also a thief. He's still a thief. He's still a thief. That's right. That's right. I took a close look at the towel. That's how I know he's a thief. You know what it says on that towel? It says Hilton. <laughs> you have a lot of problems in this country. A lot of people in America don't realize the significance of the problems we have here. One of the main problems is to try to figure out who's a Jew. Every time somebody wants to come in, if he claims he's a Jew, you don't know if he's a Jew or not, that it's a big disagreement in this whole country. How do you know if a man is a Jew? Right now, you're only considered a Jew if you were converted by an Orthodox rabbi. If an Orthodox rabbi converted you, you're a Jew. Conservative rabbi, then you're a half a Jew. Tops. Unless it was a reform rabbi. In that case, you're a Puerto Rican, and that's it. <laughs> Unless we find out he's a big contributor, then we talk it over. <laughs> Depends on how much you contribute. That's the main problem. You understand this? I don't think I'm making fun. I thank God for this country, and I thank God for the guts you have and the pride you have in being a Jew, which I don't see in America to this day. This is the pride of Judaism. It all resorts here, and you're protecting every Jew all over the world to have some pride in Judaism. Unfortunately, it's... Yeah, that's right. It's, it's not working as good as it should, because there's still Reformed Jews all over America. Do you have Reformed Jews here, too? You do? No kidding. Do they still call themselves? No, let's not pick on them. Everybody has a right to his opinion. Do they still want to be Jewish? Not completely, a little Jewish. <laughs> and if they lose it, it's better than nothing. It's, they, they want to live in a Jewish neighborhood, but they don't want anybody to know that they're exactly Jewish. They're almost Jewish, they're not sure. All they know is that they want to look like Gentiles, they all want to be seven feet tall, and get those it. <laughs> I know one temple so reformed that the rabbi is a Gentile. And they have a big sign in the front, no Jews allowed, and that's it. <laughs> I know a reform shul in the United States that's closed on Jewish holidays. <laughs> I'm not making fun of their beliefs, but the truth is that they want to sound as much of a Gentile as possible. They're not happy unless they sound and look like a Gentile. Why do you think when they talk English you can't understand them? You ever understand the reform rabbi when he talks? I never understood a word he said. I'm studying English all my life. When they talk, I don't hear a word, I don't know what he's saying. I walk at thee, thy takest, thy walketh not to thy goat. <laughs> Flaketh upon thee, talkest to them. <laughs> For he who taketh out thee to them who walketh, thanketh not. <laughs> they who walketh thee, they thanketh not. For he who cometh out to thy who thinketh, flocketh unto them as flocketh unto them. Thou who sayest unto thee, talketh thou, and say to them back, talketh thou, they begin to say, they hacketh me, they decide. And the whole congregation will say, it's up to you. <laughs> you understand this? HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yishalem Yishalem Sechodom Yishalem Sechodom Yishalem Sechodom Everybody a little louder Sin mehem kol machla Fir pahalechal nusam Fir pahalechal nusam Everybody, same thing again. <laughs> Everybody. There's no Jews in this crowd, there's no Jews. <laughs> they allow Jews into this building. What's your name? You have a Jewish name? In the United States, nobody has a Jewish name. Americans want to make sure they don't sound too Jewish, so every Jewish kid now is Tiffany Schwartz. 
<laughs> Alison Ginsberg, <laughs> Ashley Lipschitz. <laughs> he gets more reformed all the time. I know one kid is named Crucifix Finkelstein. The only people left with Jewish names anymore <laughs> are black people. They're the only ones with Jewish names that are black people. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? There's no Jewish names and there's no Jewish words. Do you understand this? The only people proud to be Jewish, the Jews in London are proud to be Jewish. Did you know that? I performed for the Jews in London and I performed for the Queen of England. Isn't that ironic that the Queen of England loved me? She didn't think I was too Jewish. I come back to the Yentas and book a little too Jewish for my taste. <laughs> the Queen of England loved me. After the show, she started to talk like me. <laughs> That's right. She said, all right, he wasn't that good. He was pretty good. I didn't like him that much, but it's better than nothing. Close enough. I didn't answer. She was too Jewish for me. <laughs> understand this? A lot of people say, I categorize people. I have that problem in this business. He generalizes too much. He categorizes people. I'm not categorizing people. The simple fact is that people behave differently in according. You see, they're even opening doors now. They're <laughs> it sounds like an Arab. What is it? <laughs> Do you understand this? I don't categorize people. I talk about people's human behavior. And behavior does change with different nationalities, different groups. That's why there's sociological studies. What do you mean by the study of sociology? Why do people study? What is the meaning of sociology? I asked you three questions, you didn't know. <laughs> if people didn't behave differently from different countries or different ages or different religions, then there would be no such thing as the study of sociology. The sociological study is a study of how people behave at different places at different times or time in history. Am I right? Is this too complicated for you? Well, that, why do you think when a person tells me what he does for a living? I always know if he's a Jew or a Gentile, and I was never wrong. Always know. In the United States, you could tell by what a person does for a living. I don't know if it's true here. Here, you might have some farmers. But if in, uh, in the United States, if a person tells you he's a farmer, you know he's not Jewish. But you might buy a farm, sell a farm. He does not work on a farm. I never heard a Jew say, Hana, is the horse ready? I never heard that. You can tell by what they do for a living. If a guy tells you a coal miner, you know he's a Gentile. I never saw a Jewish coal miner. I never saw a sign, Oibing's coal miner. I never saw <laughs> I never heard anybody in America ever say, I'm going to coal mining, then I'm going to shul for Passover. I never heard that. You ever see a yarmulke there with a light attached to it? I never saw it. <laughs> you can tell by what people do for a living. Because different professions come from different histories, different backgrounds, different cultures. Why do you think you never see such thing in the United States as a Jewish mugger? There's muggers all over the United States and people are getting mugged every day. I never heard somebody say, I was mugged by a Jew. There's no such thing as a Jewish mugger. Because a mugger has to say, give me your money or I'll kill you. A Jew could never say that. A Jew would have to say, listen, you don't have to give me all your money. <laughs> Maybe you could give me a few dollars now, we'll think it over. I don't say it has to be cash, maybe you got a check, a money order, whatever you got. Maybe you could make a call, see if somebody else has a few dollars. Sit down, let's talk it over, what's the hurry? You see, there are Jewish muggers in the United States, but they're not called muggers. They're called lawyers. <laughs> Here's another example, a stuntman. Do you know that in the whole country, in all of the United States, I make 50 movies, I never saw a Jewish stuntman. Isn't that ironic? If you can't generalize about people, how come you never saw a Jewish stuntman? Because Jew will never become a stuntman. A Jew wouldn't fly from buildings, from furniture. They don't crash into walls, into oceans. This is only for Goyim, and that's it. The, the Jews have stunts too, but they have different kinds of stunts. They take in nine million, and they show a loss. Understand this? Here's another thing you'd ever see. Is a Jewish hunting. You ever hear a Jew say, I'm going hunting? Maybe in this country. Does anybody go hunting here? I never heard in the United States of a Jew say, I'm going hunting. They will never go hunting. You know why? Nobody will see the outfit. The Jew has to show you an outfit. <laughs> if they can't show you the clothes, they don't go. You understand this? There's another thing you don't see. Is a Jewish welder. You ever see a Jewish welder? Everybody wonders, how come I never saw a Jewish welder? Because Jews don't want to weld anything. 
They don't want to be with so much noise, clapping and hacking and banging. Go and love the noise. They hear a welding machine, they clap, they hack. It's a pleasure to them. A Jew hollers, hey, it's noisy here. Let's get out of here. Somebody is welding here. They clap, they hack. It's not for Jewish people. That's why Jews became accountants, because pencils don't make no noise. <laughs> In the United States, you don't, see a, you don't see a Jewish hockey player either. You know that? Because when sticks are flying around, a Jew don't want to be there. No Jew is going to hang around with sticks clapping and hacking. Even when they're watching a hockey game, they're never in the front row. They're in the back row with binoculars. Let me see what's going on. <laughs> Go and love it. They love to hit each other in the mouth with a stick and they clap and they hack and they clap. To them, it's an orgasm for a guy. It's a night love that clap and You understand this? It's not for Jewish people. Why do you think Jews became dentists? Because Gentiles play hockey. <laughs> They know sooner or later a few teeth will be missing and a Jew will make a living. Every time you see a Gentile with a stick, you see a Jew with a card. Here's my card. There's certain things that are not for Jewish people. Why do you think you never see a Jew in the rodeo? You ever see, you know what the rodeo is? Do you people know what the rodeo is? You do. Thank God so I can tell you the whole joke. There's no Jews in the rodeo and there'll never be a Jew in the rodeo. A Jew will never sit on a horse that's going to throw you right off as they will flip. I am love to sit on a horse that's going to throw them right off and they wind up on the floor to crock and to hug it and it's a pleasure to them. It's a pleasure! It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure if you're a putz. What's the pleasure? <laughs> Not only that, they hold on with one hand. I said, schmuck, use the other hand. They don't want it. They'd rather sit on a horse that's going to throw them right off and be flits and crock and to hug it. Every time you see a Gentile in a rodeo, he's on the floor passing away. My pleasure! He loves it. He loves it. Goyim love to lay on the floor to crock and bleeding to death, and they love it. A Jew would never do this. Why? Because he's got no... This is not the Jewish character to sit on horses. That, you know, you ever notice that you never see a Jewish jockey? Do they have race horses here? Do they have racing here? But you know about race horses. You know all over the world they have races. And you know that all over the world, with all the races, there never was such a thing as a Jewish jockey. And a lot of people wonder, how come I never saw a Jewish jockey? There's a good reason for this. No Jew is going to take a job where you have to weigh 87 pounds to hold the job. <laughs> no Jew is going to give up coffee and cake just to sit on a horse. <laughs> you understand this? And they're not going to sit on a horse that's still moving. Once a horse is moving, a Jew don't sit on it. <laughs> they look for a Gentile. You sit on the horse, I'll bet on it, that's it. You never see a Jew on a moving horse. And when you see a Jew on a horse in the United States, you can bet your life. It's a very old horse, about to pass away. Then a Jewish family gets excited. I think you want to sit on a horse? Oh, give back work. God forbid it. You take one step. Watch out! You'll hurt yourself. You understand this? It's a different kind of cultural mentality. That's the whole basic idea. That people from different cultures live a different life. And this is what I came here to explain to you because you don't look intelligent enough to know about it. <laughs> we can have a little mission now. This is too good a show to go straight through. Besides, we have to give everybody a chance to go into the lobby and discuss the show. I liked him. I didn't like him. I liked him a little. I, I thought he would be better, but it's better than nothing. What do you, you care? It's a place to sit. Where are you going to go at this hour? You're going to do something else? We're here already. We'll make the best of it. You understand this? <laughs> That's not what it is. You know what every Jew will be discussing in the lobby? They'll all ask the same question. Every one of them. How old do you think he is? <laughs> and the rest I could all ask this question. How much do you think he gets for a show like that? <laughs> he must be making a fortune. What's his overhead? There's no overhead. Puts on a suit and makes a living. Not only that, he works alone, he don't even take in a partner. It takes a schmuck like you to take in a partner. You don't need a partner, you work alone. Then every Jew will become my accountant. The Lord is this. How many people would you say there are in this building right now? <laughs> Let's take a low figure. We'll take a low figure. Well, it's a typical trait of a Jew to wonder how much money everybody else is making. Because every Jew is a businessman, whether he's in business or not, it's not important. Even if he's not in business, he thinks he's in business, he's always in business. Every time somebody else makes a living, a Jew gets nervous. How come he got it before me? <laughs> but a Jew goes into a restaurant, if it's packed, do you know one Jew that could eat? They can't eat. If it's packed, they can't eat. They're too busy counting and counting. <laughs> Look at the kind of money they're taking in there. Look, at, Look what's going on here. I can't believe it. And this was the location I wanted. I wanted this location. 
My wife talked me out of it. That Yenta talked me out of it. I could have had this location. I passed it every day. I always said, this is some spot for a restaurant. And I didn't buy it. That's out of a bitch. He got the restaurant. And this is, this is not even the lunch hour. Do you know how much money they make for lunch here? Oh, yeah. Now they would like to eat, but they can't. They're too nauseous. They can't eat. You understand this? Gentiles are not always involved in business. Gentiles are involved in trying to see if they could make a living close enough. Very few Gentiles are so ambitious about life, they can make a living perfect. When Gentiles watch a fight and they see you get knocked out, they see a guy get knocked out in a fight. You see, they think around how much money they get for the fight. They wonder about the punch. I saw a heavyweight fight where a guy got knocked out in one round. Every Gentile in the United States was discussing the same thing, the punch. What kind of a punch was it? Gentiles love a punch. And they love to figure out where it came from and what kind of punch that was. That guy got $11 million for the fight. The Gentiles didn't even notice. They just wanted to know one thing. Was it a left cross, a right cross? I think it was an uppercut. It came from here, it came from there. It came, uh, they, I don't think so. I think it came like this. And then when he went, he went. The Jews, the, every Jew was just $11 million. I can't believe it. $11 million for one punch. I would love to take a punch for that kind of money. <laughs> 11 million, how long was he on the floor altogether? 10 seconds, you know how much that comes out of seconds? Out of it. Every Jew took out a pencil and paper. Let me see how much that was. The next day, every Jew was in the gym. Okay. <laughs> this has been a fantastic show for her, but this man doesn't notice it. Don't, don't fall asleep while I'm talking to you. Well, this, is, this show is not for everybody. So a lot of people, this is not exactly a cultural experience. But that happens to be the truth. A lot of people don't care that much about a comedian making speeches. A lot of people would rather see an opera, a ballet, tell them it's culture. A person telling jokes, it's not to them entertainment. So a lot of people look down on this, it's not, it doesn't impress them. I don't blame them. They go for a higher level of culture. They go for a ballet. It makes them feel like an intellectual if they enjoy a ballet. Even if they don't enjoy it, if they go, close enough. <laughs> Most of the people who go to ballet couldn't care less about the ballet, but they love to come back from the ballet. You know where I was? Oh, I was in the ballet. I was in the ballet. <laughs> oh, was this a ballet? Was this a ballet? I never saw such a ballet. Well, yeah, well, they start to walk like a ballet. The ballet, the ballet. Oh, this was the greatest ballet I ever saw. This is, oh, yes, this a ballet. Then they talk over to a guy who's also full of shit. Oh, I also love the ballet, the ballet, the ballet. They love to tell you how much they love a ballet. If so many people love a ballet, how come the whole ballet season is a week and a half every nine years? <laughs> you know why it's a week and a half every nine years? Because they're full of shit. <laughs> you believe they love a ballet? If they love a ballet so much, how come every time you take a guy out of a big city and give him a job in a small town, you come to visit him two years later, and you ask him, are you enjoying your life in this little town? Nah, I, I could have enjoyed it, but I don't. Why? There's no ballet. <laughs> What kind of life is it without a ballet? Why do you ever go to the ballet? It's not that I go. At least I know I could go if I wanted to go. At least I know it's here, it's there. You ever watch a ballet? You always see two guys dancing, dancing, and 3,000 Jews, schluffed. They schluffed and they schluffed and they're twirling and twirling, and everybody's getting nauseous. Oh, yeah, bruch. How long is she going to keep twirling like this? I get nauseous from this twirl. She's been twirling for an hour already. Doesn't she know another step? I'm getting nauseous from this twirling and twirling. And they can't figure it out. She throws herself at this guy. He don't want it. He throws herself at another guy. She keeps throwing herself at people. Nobody wants her. Can't she take a hint? I'm getting nauseous from this. And they can't figure out why she always on her toes. What is this with the toes? Can't they find a taller girl? I can't believe this. <laughs> and they always notice the pants are so tight that they with the tight little pencil. <laughs> and everybody's, what is this? I didn't come to I came for entertainment. Who wants to see his religion? It's not my business. <laughs> but that pretentiousness in people is unbelievable. People have to, you know, to go to, to college and get an education takes a long time. But to love a ballet makes you cultural with one look. You sit down and you're cultured. That's why, that's the same reason they go to operas. How many people appreciate an opera? How many? Two people out of a thousand appreciate the opera. The rest of the crowd zits and schluff. <laughs> Just like the ballet. It's the same 3,000 Jews, mishloff, right? They don't have to check into a hotel. They go to a ballet and mishloff. And they go to an opera, which love Vita, between seven ballets and two operas, they don't have to sleep again in the rest of their life. <laughs> I'm surprised they have chairs at an opera. They should have beds where everybody is sleeping. <laughs>
<laughs> Everybody is sleeping at every opera. <laughs> Instead of a suit, they should come with pajamas if they were out. They should come with pajamas and they should come ready to say their prayers. Everybody should be late. Am I right? How many people are enjoying the opera? I'm not making fun of the people who are enjoying God bless them. There's some people who actually enjoy it. You know how many? Two out of the three thousand. The rest have to tell you, oh, I'm going to the opera. I came from the opera full of shit with their opera. Engage me, engage me, engage me. And not only that, they become even more pretentious. They tell you they study the opera. This opera, they know inside out. They are such an expert on this opera. There is not one part of this opera they don't know. And as soon as they start watching it, we lost. <laughs> Two goyim are screaming and the Jews are howling. Bush, right, man, as if bush, right. Man. They're trying to sleep and the goyim are screaming and screaming. Let me sleep a little, bush, right, baby, Mr. Goyim. Nobody watches it because it's all the same story. It's nothing to watch anyway. Sooner or later, in every opera, the same thing happens. He stabs her in the heart and she starts singing and singing. <laughs> and the more he stabs her, the better she sings. He's tired. Most people, if you stab them in the heart, they pass away. They lay on the floor. They're bleeding. Not in an opera. In an opera, they sing to me, sing to me, sing. The more he stabs her, the better her voice gets. He stabbed me in the heart, in the heart. He stabbed me in the heart. And then he starts singing, I stab her, I stab her. In the heart, I stab her, in the heart, in the Then the whole chorus starts singing, stab her, stab her, in the heart, in the heart, stab her, in the heart. See you later.